Would you stand and join us as we sing this morning? Of oh, the mercies of the Lord forever I will sing. I will sing. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever I will sing. Of the mercies of the Lord with my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness. of the Lord. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness through all generations. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. Welcome, and would you remain standing as we continue to sing this morning? God sent His Son. They called Him Jesus. He came to love. He
God's people said, Amen. Good morning. We're glad to have you with us this morning. Once again, as I said earlier, if you're a guest and you're with us this morning as a guest, we would ask that, look in the back of your pew, there's a small card there that we can have record of your, of your visit this morning. If you would, fill that out and stick it in the church in the back behind the very last pew in that slotted top of that church, if you would, so that we'd have a record of your visit. We're glad to have you with us this morning. On this beautiful Sunday morning, we're hoping that you bless as the choir takes a moment to share a special with you now. Amen, and choir, thank you for reminding us of that awesome message that we have the privilege as God's people to go into his very throne room of grace and pour out our concerns and our burdens to him, and prayer is what we will do in just a 
few moments, but as we continue in worship and to prepare our hearts to go to the Lord in prayer, I want us to go to the book of Hebrews. As you uh, know, if you remember a couple weeks ago, we've started reading through the book of Hebrews on Sunday mornings, and so this morning we find ourselves in Hebrews chapter 7, and we're going to start in verse 11, and this is a pretty lengthy section. The, the subject of this section is Jesus being compared to this mysterious Old Testament pre, uh, priest and king by the name of Melchizedek. And so as I read through the words of our Lord, listen closely as uh, we learn about this mysterious king. And so let's stand as we honor the reading of God's holy word Again, Hebrews chapter 7, starting in verse 11. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For then there is a change in the priesthood. There is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident, for it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. And in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priest. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but from the power of an indestructible life. For it is witness of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on the, on, for on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside, because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath, for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever." This makes Jesus the guarantee of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through faith since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it is indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins, and he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath which came latter than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Amen. Well, this morning we know that we go to the throne room of grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. He is our mediator, and as the text says, he is our high priest. He is our intercessor, and he intercedes for us even when we don't realize that we have a need you realize that god knows what's going to come around the next corner aren't you glad of that and right now god is uh is hearing prayers from his son on our behalf that uh as we as we go through this life as believers we will persevere through his grace well this morning as we go to the lord in prayer i want to mention two prayer requests First of all, you may have heard on the news that they are, um, are predicting that possibly tomorrow the Supreme Court will give a ruling on the Roe versus Wade decision. 
And I cannot emphasize enough how important it is as God's people we pray that God will have mercy on our nation. We want to pray for the justices. We want to pray for men and women who have participated in abortion, that they would find grace and healing in Christ Jesus, and that God would have mercy on our nation. So please join with me in praying for that need. And then one other need, um, I mentioned this in prayer meeting. Miss Pam, our church secretary a year ago, had surgery uh, to remove a cancerous tumor, which they at the time said they got all the, all the cancer. Well, she has received news that her cancer has returned. And so she is going to be going through lots of chemotherapy and radiation. So I'm just asking church family if you will please pray for Miss Pam. I'm also going to ask one more thing. Uh, I know, church family, that you love Miss Pam and you care for her, and there's the, there is that uh, desire that you want to call her and talk to her. But I'm going to ask you to hold off from doing that. Um, you, if you've gone through that journey, you know how difficult and stressful that can be. And, and so I'm asking us not to call Miss Pam and ask her a bunch of questions. If you, if you talk to her, just simply let her know that you're praying for her. And uh, certainly that will be sufficient to minister to her spirit. So I know that you have your own request and your own concerns. So at this time, let's go to the throne room and let's roll our burdens onto the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we do have a high priest in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And we thank you that today, no matter what we face in life, we have hope, we have strength because of your ultimate sacrifice that you gave by giving your life on the cross for us, atoning for our sins, providing our justification. And Lord, today we come with heavy hearts as we have our own concerns, our own burdens. Lord, help us to roll those burdens onto you, knowing that you care for us and you carry our burdens. Lord, I pray for those who are discouraged, those who are facing difficult decisions, those who have deep hurts, and wounds. Lord, I pray that you would minister to them. Lord, this morning we want to pray for Miss Pam. We pray for her physically. We pray for her emotionally and spiritually. We ask that as she goes through these many weeks of treatment, that uh, you would remind her that your grace is sufficient. We pray for your very best for Miss Pam. Lord, we also pray for our nation. As we are in a time in our nation, a very, very dark time, and we are in great need of your mercy. And we pray especially for the Supreme Court and those justices. We, we pray for their protection as we've received news that their very lives are being threatened. And we pray for them. We pray that they would give a ruling that would honor you. And we pray that our nation would have a touch from heaven that we would see lives repenting of sin, getting right with you. And Lord, individually as believers, we, we live in concerning times, but these are exciting times. What a great time that we have to be the salt and light that you've called us to be. Help us to, to be believers who point others to you. It's very easy in these times to complain and murmur about all the negative things that we see, and we're all guilty of it. But as believers, we have the good news of Jesus Christ. And we know that you are on your throne and you are reigning and ruling and we know what happens in the end. Our allegiance is ultimately to you in your kingdom. But Lord, we want to be faithful earthly citizens of this land and we above all want to live according to your will. Lord, I thank you for each and every one who is here today. I pray if there's anybody here today who's never trusted Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would open their eyes to you today and that they would run to the cross and receive salvation today. Lord, we love you. We thank you. I, I thank you again for each and every one who is here. Lord, I thank you for the songs that we sing, for your word, and we pray that all things that happen in this place will bring honor and glory to your great name. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come longing just to breathe 
something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Listen as Bethany sings this verse. King of endless worth, no one could express how much you deserve though i'm weak and poor all i have is yours every single breath i'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. All about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. If you will, turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, we're going to go back and pick up where we left off last week. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 and 26 will be our text today. This week I decided to go through our kitchen drawers and I went through all of our kitchen tools and I found a tool that has become very very valuable to us this is a precious tool it's priceless and I'm going to show it to you Does anybody know what this is called? It's got a little smiley face on there because it'll make you smile. How many of you like corn? Everybody in this room better raise your hands because, uh, <laughs> yeah, we love corn. This tool 
is called a corn zipper. And it will absolutely revolutionize your life if you like to eat corn. Especially if you're one of those who you don't like to grab the corn by the cob and just gnaw into it. You want your corn cut off the cob. Do we have any of those in the house? Okay, well, if that is you, you're going to want to get one of these. Because this thing, you put it right on the cob and you just effortlessly rake it down and it will perfectly take off the kernels off of the cob. Again, it will revolutionize your life. Now, last year, I think we paid about $12 on Amazon. Or Amazon. So now it's probably up to about $36. But I want to encourage you to order one of these. Not now while I'm preaching, but when I get done, you get on your phone and order one of these. A corn zipper. Google it, and you'll find it. I see Brandy. She's writing it down. <laughs> and I tell you what, I'll make a deal. If you want to try it first, you can try ours before you make that investment. But you will love it. You say, preacher, what in the world does a corn zipper have to do with the Bible. Well, the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, that we as believers are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. In other words, God in his mercy and grace has saved us not just so that we can go to heaven when we die, but he has saved us to be vessels to be tools for his kingdom so that he can use us to accomplish his purposes, to use us to bring glory to his name. And so the title of this morning's message is one word, and that word is useful. And the challenge that we are facing today is this question, am I right now, am I being used by the Lord? To accomplish things for his name. Am I right now being useful to God? Listen to what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 20. The Bible says, Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach patiently, enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. So, are you useful to the Lord? Is God using you right now, where you are at in your life, is he using you as an honorable vessel in order to accomplish his purposes? And certainly, as followers of Christ today, if you name the name of Christ... Hopefully it is your desire that you want God to use you to do great things for his kingdom. And hopefully today we share the passion of the Apostle Paul when he wrote in Philippians chapter 1 verses 19 through 20 or 21. He says, for I, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by my life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. The overall consuming passion of Paul's life was to glorify the Lord with his life. And he says, you know, I, I'm in this turmoil. He says, you know, I, I, I want to stay here on one hand and I want to continue to be used by God to minister, to help, uh, or, or allow the Lord to use me to, to build his, 
his uh, kingdom, but then on the other hand, I'm ready to go to glory and to see uh, my Lord. And, 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 and today, I, uh, again, I hope that that is your desire, that you desire that every aspect of your life is, is to be used by God for his uh, glory. And so here's, here is uh, Paul instructing Timothy. Again, Paul's coming to the end of his race. He knows that his earthly ministry is about to conclude. He also senses that Timothy is becoming discouraged in his ministry. And so he challenges Timothy to stay the course, to fight the good fight, to continue working for the Lord. So in these uh, verses, Paul instructs Timothy and you and I this morning how to become useful instruments for God's purposes. Now, I've taken this text, I've divided it into two sections. So if you're taking notes... We see, first of all, in verse 20, we find the illustration that demonstrates usefulness. So he's going to give us an illustration that, that, that illustrates, that demonstrates this idea of usefulness in God's kingdom. So let's look at this, this illustration that he gives us in verse 20. And what we find in verse 20, he talks about a great house. You notice that? He says, now, in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable use. So here's this great house. This is a, a wealthy person's house. It's a large house. And in this house there would be all kinds of different vessels. And you could classify, you could put those vessels in one of two groups. Honorable vessels dishonorable vessels. Vessels just simply mean jars or containers, bowls, dishes, cups, utensils that would be used in order to accomplish different things within the house. Now, honorable vessels were made of gold and silver. They were valuable. They, they had much worth. And so those type of vessels, they would be used for special occasions. They would be used to, to honor special guests. Those type vessels were, were displayed publicly. And so you, you would break out your fine china if you had somebody over for, uh, for dinner. You'd break out your silver and get your silver polished up. But then, in this large house, not only were there honorable vessels, but there were also dishonorable vessels. Vessels. The dishonorable vessels were made of wood and clay. And, and, and these type vessels would be used for everyday purposes. Uh, they, and and, and these, these vessels were not displayed for everybody to see, but they're, they're kept in the closet when they're not being used. They're kept out of sight. These, these containers, uh, especially in ancient homes, they, they would be used for taking out the trash, uh, mop buckets, even bedpans for, for removing human waste. And so understanding the illustration, certainly you, you wouldn't serve your, your pot roast out of a trash can, nor would you use uh, one of your pieces of fine china as a, as a mop bucket. Now some of you husbands may have tried that, but you tried it one time. It's just understood that there's honorable vessels used for honorable use, and then there's dishonorable vessels used for dishonorable uses. So what's the, what's the great analogy here? Well, the, the metaphor is, is clear here. The metaphor of the great house is referring to the church. This is, this is God's people. If you go back to verse 19, which we looked at uh, last week as we talked about stopping the spread of false teaching. He, he talks about God's firm foundation. He says God's firm foundation stands... Again, what was the firm, the firm foundation? The firm foundation, verse 19, is referring to the church. And so, so verse 19 sets up this metaphor. In the church, there are two kinds of vessels. There are honorable vessels, and then there are dishonorable vessels. Now, there's a little bit of some theological debate here as to what Paul is saying. Some, some say Paul is saying that in the church, within the church, you will find believers, honorable vessels, but then you'll also find false believers, unbelievers, and those would be uh, dishonorable vessels. 
And, and last week we, we learned about two that were in the church at Ephesus. They were dishonorable vessels, Hymenaeus and Philetus. Others say that, that Paul is differentiating between different kinds of believers that you find in the church. That, that in the church there are some believers that are faithful and, and they are committed to Christ and, and His truth. They're committed to being used by the Lord. They're passionate uh, about the Lord. But then there are also uh, dishonorable vessels un, or believers that they're, they're unfaithful, they're uncommitted, they're, they're not living sanctified lives. You might refer to them, I don't prefer this term, but some would say they're, they're carnal believers. Maybe they're even dabbling in false teaching so so which one is it is it paul's differentiating between believers and unbelievers or is he just differentiating between different kinds of believers well i i think that it can be both i think certainly in any given church you'll find unbelievers they know the right things to say they're cultural christianities they believe all the facts they've walked the aisle they filled out the card they got wet in the baptistry but they've never been born again you find those in the in the church but I also believe that, that you also find believers, they're saved, but they're uncommitted. They're unfaithful. They're, they're, they're not concerned about living holy lives. And maybe there are some believers that, are, that have been deceived by some false teaching. Nonetheless, you find two vessels. There's two kinds of vessels. Those who are being used by God and those who are dishonorable. They're not... They're not accomplishing God's purposes. They're not bringing honor and glory to, to the Lord's um, name. They're not leading anybody to Christ. They're not discipling anybody. They're not serving the body of Christ. Acts chapter 9, verse 15. The Lord said this regarding the Apostle Paul. He said, he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And when we study the life of Paul, certainly we find that he was an honorable vessel. He was faithful and he was a committed vessel in the Lord's church and was used greatly by the Lord. And we're sitting here this morning and we're still being blessed by God's faithful la labor for the Lord as we are reading this letter that God used Paul's hand to write. So that is the illustration that demonstrates usefulness. That's the foundation for the sermon. Now we go to the bulk of the message, and that is in verses 21 through 26. And our second division is this. We find the instruction that teaches usefulness. So in verses 21 and 26, Paul provides instructions to teach us what is necessary what is necessary of us today? What must we understand if we want to be used greatly by the Lord? And I can only assume today that if you're born again, you're blood washed, that you have a desire to be used by the Lord for His honor. And what we're going to find here is our usefulness is not determined by our personality. It is not determined by the amount of money we have in our bank account. It's not even determined by our talent. None of that determines our usefulness in the hands of the Lord. Really, there's one word here that, that sums up this whole section, and that is the word holiness. Holiness. God wants to use holy vessels for His service. Just like in a, in a house... you. You don't use a nasty dog bowl to serve your soup in. I didn't get an amen. That's concerning. <laughs> you say, Brother Michael, we live in southwest Georgia. You don't understand. Things are done a little bit differently here. Well, maybe that's the way they're done in your house. But in most houses, you use clean vessels to do, for, for honorable uses. And, and the Lord, he wants to use clean vessels vessels not dirty vessels now praise god i want to say this that in god's grace we know from the bible that there are no perfect vessels in fact you study the scriptures there's a lot of messed up vessels but the one thing that you find in in, in the lives of people that god greatly uses they had the passion they had the desire 
to live lives for God's glory. And so holiness. Now, just a little theological understanding that we need to have. As believers, there's, there is what I call positional holiness. So that means that if today you're saved, if you have, if you have repented of your sins and you have by faith, trusted in the finished work of Jesus Christ. You have surrendered to Christ to be your Savior and Lord. Positionally speaking, when God looks at you, you are perfectly holy. Folks, it's okay to say amen there. Because I don't know about you, but there's mornings that I wake up and I feel really, really bad because I don't live like I should for God's glory. But in that moment... I have the confident assurance that my confidence in the eyes of God is not my personal holiness, it's the righteousness of Christ that has been imputed to me. So positionally speaking, if you're saved today, you are perfectly holy because the moment you placed your faith in Christ, your sins were forgiven and you were given the righteousness of Christ and on the day of judgment you will stand because you have the righteousness of Christ that speaks for you. That is positional holiness. But then there is, there is more of the sanctified holiness. That's, that's the practical holiness. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness with which, without which no one will see the Lord. So, so we are made holy by God's grace. But God expects us to live out. Are you listening? God expects us as Christians to live out in our practice who he has made us to be in our position. So in other words, if you are, if you are a Christian this morning, he has made you holy, now live like it. Live like the person that you are in Christ. And that is absolutely imperative. If we want God to use us to bring glory to his name, if we want to be honorable vessels, we must live holy lives. So there's, there's, there's several things here that he, that he mentions in these verses that are instructions for us if we're, going to, if we're going to be useful vessels for him. So verse 21, Paul teaches us you must discern what is helpful. Okay, you must discern, or discern, however you want to pronounce it, you must discern what is helpful. Look back at verse 21. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable. Well, what is he talking about? What is dishonorable? Well, it's those unholy vessels, those dishonorable vessels. So, so he's saying cleanse yourself from what is dishonorable. Cleanse yourself... From, from the, the negative influence of, of dishonorable vessels. So that means that as believers, we must use discernment. We, we, we have to have wisdom to be very, very careful with the type of influences we allow in our lives. We, we don't want to have unhelpful influences in our lives. First uh, Corinthians 15, 33. This is a verse that you've heard many times. Evil company corrupts good morals. So, so church, if you want to be used by God, it is absolutely imperative that you are guarded and you avoid the influence of unhelpful vessels that are in the church. Use wisdom and discernment to guard yourself from those that you allow in your life to influence you. So certainly we, we need to have discernment so that we're, we're not negatively influenced by false teachers, Hymenaeus and Philetus. I'm not going to belabor that because we talked about that last week. But also as believers within the church, we need this discernment with the type of interaction and communion that we have with professing, are you listening? With professing Christians in the church who are uncommitted, they're unfaithful, and they're living unsanctified lives. Now sometimes these are people that, that 
are at church all the time. We, we know these types of profess, uh, professing Christians well, and, and oftentimes we, we like them. And, and, and so I'm not saying that we have to be rude to these kind of people and that we can't ever minister to or associate to these kind of unhelpful influences. We just have to be very guarded and use discernment with the influences that we allow in our lives. Don't let negative influences pull you in the wrong direction in regards to your relationship to Christ. Uh, you mark it down. If, if, you, if, if you allow professing Christians in your life that are very, very negative, I, I mean, they're not doing anything in the church, but they find every problem in the church. Oh, they, they easily point out the problem, but they don't ever provide a solution. Be careful with that kind of influence in your life. Don't let their water put out your fire. Are you hearing me? Don't let their unsanctified lives corrupt your desire to live a sanctified life. Be very, very discerning in your life. Secondly, not only must we discern what is helpful, but in verse 22, if you're going to be used by God, you must flee what is sinful. You must flee what is sinful. Go back to verse 22. He says, so flee youthful passions. Flee youthful passions. Flee is an interesting word in the Greek. It's fuego, which is where we get our English word fugitive. What does a fugitive do that has broken out of jail? They're fleeing, right? They're always fleeing. They're always on the run. And, and so Paul is instructing Timothy. He says, always, this is a... This is a, it's an imperative in the Greek. It's in the present tense. So he's saying, Timothy, always flee youthful passions. Now, when the first thing that comes to our mind is sexual passions. And, and certainly that, that applies here, but I think it goes deeper than, than just that within the, the context. He's saying, Timothy, like a fugitive that's always on the run, constantly flee those those passions that are that so often younger people chronically struggle with because of their immaturity what are those things he's talking about well anger constantly flee anger do you struggle with anger pride impatience have you found that younger children oftentimes are very impatient so flee impatience, constantly be on the run away from impatience. Flee greed, always wanting more, 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 more. Jealousy, and certainly, Timothy, always flee selfishness. Selfishness is antithetical to, to service that God has called us to. So, so we must... We must always be on, on guard against unhealthy or unhelpful companions, but here we see that we should always flee ungodly character. And, and, and I hope that this is true of you this morning. Are you, if you're a professing believer, is it, again, we're not perfect. We all have our moments, but it is, is it the desire of your heart that you strive to flee these kind of things? But you're always trying to run from ungodliness and sinful things in your life. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. That's the key. Every morning we wake up, we have a decision to make. Am I going to walk by the Spirit or am I going to walk according to the flesh? So we, we must flee what is sinful. But then also in verse 22, we must pursue what is rightful. We must pursue what is rightful. So in other words, you remove some things out of your life, now you have to replace what you've re removed. He says pursue, there in verse 22, pursue 
righteousness, faith, love, peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. This is another, this is a, a, this is a, uh, a, a active command here. He's saying, not only should you always flee unrighteousness, but always seek after, and he lists these, these things. He says, seek after, pursue righteousness. What is righteousness? Well, it's, it's godliness. Literally in the Greek, it, it says righteousness is, is to be straight. Okay, so, so pursue a life that is straight. Live a straight life. Don't be shady in your character, is what he is saying here. He says pursue faith. You could really translate that faithfulness. If you're, if you're faithful, you're faithful, you're committed in your walk with Christ, and in his will for your life, you're faithful to serve the Lord. So God can count on you. And by the way, if you're faithful, that means others can count on you. Does your word mean anything? I, I mean, I, I wonder, I hope that it can be said of you that when your fellow believers, when you tell them you're going to do something, they say, you know what, they're going to do it. Or do they say, well, talk is cheap. They say a lot of things, but they hardly ever do what they say. You can't count on them. He says, pursue faithfulness. And then, thirdly, he says, pursue love. This is an agape love. This is a, this is a love of action. It's not love based upon emotion. And so it's, it's showing selfless and self-giving love towards others. Again, selfish people, they don't make useful tools because they're always living for self and that is something that we all have to battle against, if we're honest. You know, it's easy to live for numero uno, right? We're born in the human race. We know how to live for number one. But we have to crucify self, and we have to love others selflessly. And then he says, strive for peace. Pursue peace. And I think what he has in mind here is to always live at peace with one another. Useful vessels. They, they, they try to live lives that are in harmony with, with others. Paul said in Romans 12, verse 18, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And then finally, what, are, what else are we to pursue? There's a fifth thing, and that's godly fellowship. That's godly fellowship. You say, where do you, where do you get that at? He says, well... He, he says, pursue faith, love, peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. He's saying, you, you pursue fellowship with others that you see are pursuing these things. They're serious in, uh, about their walk with Christ. They are committed, they're faithful to the Lord. Those are the ones that you want to have close fellowship with. So you must pursue what is rightful. Then he moves on in verse 23. If you're going to be useful to the Lord, you must avoid what is hurtful. You must avoid what is hurtful. What is it that's hurtful that we must avoid? Pick up verse 23. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. So avoid what is hurtful. We, we talked in depth about this last week. If you, if you go back up there to verse 16... He says, but avoid irreverent babble, for it only lead people into more and more ungodliness. So, so he's saying, avoid while we, while we stand firmly on truth. Don't get distracted by senseless debates and arguments over things that have no eternal value. Keep the main thing the main thing in church what is the main thing jesus the gospel don't get distracted by these these silly arguments in fact the the word that um, he uses for foolish is the greek word moros what word do you think we get from that moron just avoid stupid arguments is literally what he's what he's saying Keep the main thing the main thing. Don't get caught up in senseless and useless 
things. They don't, they don't do anything to help others, and they're not going to help you. It just breeds strife. And, and people that, that like to quarrel and argue, they're always looking for a fight. Proverbs gives us some wisdom about this. Proverbs 15, 18, A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. Proverbs 20, verse 3, It is an honor for a man to keep aloft from strife, but every fool will be quarreling. James chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of of God. So, so avoid those things that are hurtful, senseless arguments and debates that they don't help you, they don't help others. I remember when we were graduating seminary, we had a church that contacted us. And uh, the name of the church was Harmony Baptist Church. Harmony Baptist Church. And uh, we got pretty good ways into the process. And I thought that we were going to be in fact, they voted to, to, to call me to be their pastor, but then right after they had the vote, there was a quarrel going on in the church. This was the quarrel. Would they receive other translations, English translations of the Bible, other than the King James Version of the Bible? I'm not talking about, you know, they were debating on whether or not they would you know, have Bibles that had the Apocrypha in it or, or the, 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 the Book of Mormon or the Watchtower. That's not what I'm talking about. They just had a debate. Is it okay that a preacher preaches out of a New King James Version of the Bible? And guess what happened? That Harmony Baptist Church, it split. I believe that's part of what Paul's talking about here. Avoid split. Stupid, foolish arguments like that. Keep the main thing the main thing. If you're always looking for a fight, you're not going to be very useful to the Lord. And then finally, verses 24 through 26, if we want to be useful to the Lord, we must minister what is useful. We must minister what is useful. Now look, at, look with me. Verse 24 is absolutely key to this whole thing. He says, and the Lord's what? Servant. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. Our identity as believers is we are servants. The Greek says bond servants, a doulos. Literally, we are slaves. To Christ. The slaves, to Christ, we don't have rights. We gave that up the moment we surrendered our life to Christ. We're not called to be fighters. We're called to be servants. And when you begin to see your identity is that you are a servant, that means that God has called you to serve others, to minister to others. Don't go around fighting with everybody. And boy, our culture... Man, if you're looking for a fight, this is the culture to live in. And be very careful on social media because you can quickly get drawn in and pulled into all kinds of silly arguments. As believers, we're not called to be fighters. Again, there's times that we stand firmly on truth. There may even be times that because of our, of our stand on accurate doctrine that we are part of a controversy, but we avoid those senseless things because we are servants we are called to be ministers to others. And what are the things that we should minister? What are these useful things that we should minister to others? Well, he says, minister kindness. Be servants to others by being kind to others. Be gentle and, and kind, yes, even to your enemies. Remember, Timothy's got a tough assignment here. He's got these false teachers. They're attacking him. They're attacking his character. Paul certainly had that everywhere he went. But even for those who attack us, we're called to be gentle. So I guess you could say we're called to act like Jesus, right? Now, I'm just going to tell you right now. If you think you're going to minister kindness to others in your flesh, you're deceived. That's why it's so important, church, that every day we walk in the Spirit. 
I could call my family up here and they could give you illustration after illustration of times that their husband and their daddy doesn't walk in the spirit. And what it looks like and how ugly it is. And guess what? I could do the same with you as well. But when we're walking in the spirit, when the spirit of God is in control of our lives and we can minister kindness and gentleness even to those that we disagree with and even to those who are attacking us, he says, minister instruction. He talks about that when, when he, he says, be able to teach. So, so in love, let us teach what is true. Gently stand on truth as you teach others. The greatest thing that people need is truth. Boy, our culture today is starving for truth. And sadly, they don't want it, but that doesn't exempt us from giving it to them. We do it, but we do it in love. We minister patience. What are, what are we called to give people who, who hurt us and wrong us? Patience. We're to patiently endure malicious attacks and injustices done towards us. We're, to, we're, we're not, to, re, we're not to, to attack them back. But instead, we endure with patience. Let us be, let us, you know, I think that if I'm not careful, uh, I'm very quick to be offended. Is that true of you at times? Paul here is saying, don't be so quick to be uh, offended, but instead extend patience and extend grace to others. Maybe when your fellow church member said something that really rubbed you raw, maybe they were just in a moment and they were going through something very, really difficult that had nothing to do with you. Let's be kind and let's be patient towards one another. Why should we? Because God is patient with us, right? Amen, I'm so glad he's patient with us. And then finally, as we're talking about ministering what is useful to others, he, he concludes with this final thing that, we, that we're called, if we're going to be useful servants, that we should minister to others that is, that is useful to others, and that is minister correction. Minister correction. You, you, you see that where, where he says there in verse 25, correcting his opponents with gentleness. Again, Timothy, he, he had these false teachers right in the church, and Paul says you've got to confront them, Timothy. That's what love does. Love demands that we correct those who, who, are, who are either believing error or they're living in such a way that is dis dishonoring to the Lord. Church, that's what we are called to do with our fellow Christians. If we have a fellow brother and sister in Christ and they veered off the path and they're doing something to dishonor the Lord, Matthew 18 commands us in a spirit of love that we are to provide correction to that individual. And we do it humbly, and we do it gently and compassionately, but why do we do it? He gives us the answer there at the end of the text. He says, he says you, you correct your opponents with gentleness so that God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will so here we have a, a fellow church member they profess to know jesus they're living in such a way that dishonors the lord the bible says it's the truth that sets captives free but so often what do we do we just turn a blind eye to it right but that's not giving them what they need paul is saying you minister to that person don't, don't turn a blind eye to it. You minister to them. And how do you minister to them? By compassionately and lovingly confronting them with truth. And so you go to them and you say, listen, you know how much I love you. But I am concerned because of this particular area in your life. And you're hurting the name of Christ. And you're hurting yourself. And you're hurting your family. And I just believe that if we're faithful to do that, God can use that to help open the eyes of the blind. Because you know what? There's times that all of us have become blind. 
And aren't you glad for those faithful friends that come to you and say, listen, I love you, and I'm concerned about you, and what you're doing is wrong. Now, I'm not talking about us being, you know, little nitpickers and every single time we see another brother or sister in Christ do something dishonorable that we immediately, but I'm talking about if there's a brother or sister in Christ, you know what I'm talking about. They, they have, they, it, is, it is just kind of a public thing that they, are, for an ongoing season, they're living in some kind of way that is dishonoring to the Lord. What do we minister to them, or how do we minister to them? We confront them in a spirit of love, hoping that God will help bring them to a place of repentance. All right. So again, we're talking about being useful to the Lord. How about you this morning? What kind of vessel are you this morning? Are you being used as an honorable vessel? God is using you mightily to help build his kingdom. Or this morning, are you a dishonorable vessel? You're not, you're not ministering life to others. You're, you're, not, you're not doing anything to, to, to serve the king. And the question this morning is not, do you have a title? You say, yeah, preacher, I mean, I'm a, I'm a Sunday school teacher. I'm a deacon. I'm on such and such committee. I'm a lay preacher. That's not what I'm asking because you know what? This is the thing. You can have a title but not be a useful vessel. It's not are you a Sunday school teacher. Is, what's more, more important is are you passionate about it? Is God using you to be a blessing? And, and so two words of application and then we're, we'll finish. Number one, examine your heart. It all goes to desire. What is your heart's desire this, this morning? If you are a professing follower of Christ, do you really have the desire to be used by God, church? Or are you satisfied simply coming to church every Sunday morning, sitting in your pew, hearing a preacher, and then leaving? Are you satisfied with that? Or do you have a burning desire in your heart that you want God to use your life for His glory? Is that your desire? Or are you simply just satisfied being here, living your life, making sure everything goes the way that you want it until God calls you home? It goes back to desire. Let us examine our hearts this morning. Number two. Finally, so we examine our hearts and then we need to perhaps empty our lives. Empty our lives. We, we need to get rid of some things in our life that are dirty and, and defiling that is keeping us from being used by the Lord. I, I read an article this week that uh, they received a grant to, to clean out Lake Tahoe. And so these divers began diving in Lake Tahoe, and they've pulled out 25,000 pounds of trash. They found, as you can imagine, all kinds of aluminum cans. They found engine blocks, sunglasses, cell phones. They've even found engagement rings. 25,000 pounds of garbage. Maybe there's some things in your life that you need to empty your life of. Maybe there's some unhealthy relationships, some unhealthy influences that you're allowing into your life that is pulling you in the wrong direction. Maybe there's some kind of ungodliness in your life and you need to clean up your vessel. Maybe you just need to get serious about pursuing some of these things that Paul talked about. But I go back to the question, do you have the desire this morning, church, is it your burning desire that you want to live for Jesus Christ and for His glory? Life is short, church. We don't have much time. But our King, He is worthy, is He not? What's your desire this morning? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we, we thank You so much that in Your grace You have saved us. And in Christ, if we have repented of our sins and, and we have not just intellectually believed the facts, but we have, we have truly 
believed what you did for us on the cross and, and we have given you our life, Lord, may we not just be satisfied in saying that we're saved and we're on our way to glory, but Lord, give us the desire to serve you and to be used by you. And if we've lost that desire, help us to acknowledge to you what you already know is true and change our hearts. Lord, if there's some things in our lives, some dirty things that we need to empty our lives of by your grace, Lord, bring those things to our minds so that we can flee those things. But then, oh God, in your grace, help us to pursue righteousness and love and peace so that you can use however amount of time that we have left on this side of eternity to influence others to help build your kingdom all for your glory lord we love you we thank you and praise you and we ask these things in jesus name amen well this time i invite you to stand as we have our hymn of invitation this morning this is your opportunity to respond if you want to come to the altar and you just want to pour your heart out to god you do that if there's something in your life you don't have peace with god you say you know what i, I don't know for sure that i'm saved this morning i don't know for sure i have a home in heaven call upon the name of the lord trust that he died on the cross for your sins and live the rest of your days for his glory and if you need help doing that you come forward and help us to teach you how you can be saved. Whatever it is that God is leading you to do, would you do it as we sing hymn number 454, Have Thine Own Way. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the me and try me, Master, today, whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. may be seated. God is good and God is working in lives and I want to tell you how he's working in lives this morning. First of all, we have Brother James and Sister Kelly. They are coming desiring to join First Baptist Church. So they're going to begin that process. They're going to, next Sunday morning, they're going to go through the, the new members uh, class and after that, if they still sense that God is, is leading them to plant their lives here at First Baptist Church, 
then uh, we will receive them next Sunday. So I'm going to ask you all to stand. This is exciting, and we, we're always excited, so if you want to just turn around here. <laughs> now, they have some family here. Um, I think that you know most of them, but if you belong to these, would you just raise your hand so that we know who you are? All right. Yes, this is Miss Brandy's parents, and so we're, we're excited. So, Brother James, Miss, Miss Kelly, we, we look forward to seeing how God is going to use y'all. All right, and then finally, we have the sisters that are coming today. I'm so excited about Miss Barbara and Miss June. It's been several, several weeks ago, God and his providence brought the sisters to us. And uh, I have been so blessed getting to know them and they have gone through the new members class, and so today they're wanting to plant their lives in this church through the transfer of church letter. And so, ladies, we look forward to seeing how God is going to use you. And uh, I'm going to get you all to stand up, too, if you don't mind. I'm going to let everybody see your faces. If you officially... <laughs> Receive Miss Barbara and Miss June to be a member here at First Baptist Church. Would you give a good hearty amen? Amen. 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 All right. Okay. I'm going to ask y'all, if y'all don't mind, if y'all would just be seated right here. And then after the service, I know that people are going to want to greet you. But you can stay, stay seated because I still got a couple more things I've got to say. <laughs> All right. So open up your Bibles to 2 Timothy. I'm teasing. <laughs> James and Kelly say, forget about joining here, We're going somewhere else. This guy's crazy. All right, got a few announcements, and then we'll pray, and we'll be dismissed. Next Sunday morning is, is going to be an exciting morning as we have the Lord's Supper. So pray about that, and then after the morning service, we will have our fifth Sunday meal. I love fifth Sunday meals, as you do as well. Uh, and so be sure that you bring out your favorite uh, recipes. Tonight we are going to have a spring concert. Looking forward to that with Johnny Payne. He'll come and he'll bless us in music. Many of you are familiar with Brother Johnny. And then afterwards we're going to have a homemade ice cream fellowship. If you haven't signed up yet to bring your favorite recipe, that's okay. Bring it uh, because we want to have as many flavors as, uh, as possible. Uh, if you are on the personnel committee, I need to meet with you for about 30 seconds right after the service. We'll meet right back here in the uh, ladies of the word uh, class, women of the word, excuse me. Next Saturday, I've been asked to announce that at 9 a.m. we're going to have a VBS decorating party. And so please come out and let's uh, get busy decorating. VBS is almost here, and that is an exciting uh, time. So if you would like to come and help decorate be here at the church next saturday morning at 9 a.m yes ma'am all right you, you take live animals too no okay i just want to clarify that all right awesome have any questions, see Miss Bethany. She'll give you all the details. All right, well, let's stand. We're going to pray. It's been a good day in the house of the Lord. I'm so blessed by you being here today. Let us, oh, oh, yes, yes. Thank you, Brother Jeff. I need a few buff men so you can classify yourself right after the service. Help us move the uh, pulpit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this great day. Thank you, O oh God, that in your grace, not only have you saved us, but, Lord, we thank you that you want to use us as instruments. Lord, we don't deserve that. Lord, forgive us if we've become apathetic regarding that. Lord, ignite a, heart, a fire in our hearts. Put us on fire for Jesus if we've lost that fire. Lord, we look in our world today and we see a lot of concerning things. There's a lot of hurting people. But we have what they need in Jesus Christ. May we be faithful to do that. Lord, thank you for moving in the hearts of these who've come forward today. We're excited about all that you're going to do through them. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.